It seemed like all the others. This is insane. Holy f But high winds whip this modest fire into a raging inferno. Firefighters began calling it the beast. Oh, you can feel the heat. It's like nothing I'd ever seen before. Holy sh This is crazy. The beast turns to before the fire catches up to you. Oh my God. Where do you even go? Where do you go to avoid this thing? There's one main road in and out of town. You have no choice but to pack up a couple valuable items and drive out of there because your house is gonna burn down. Evacuating is certainly the right thing to do, but how heartbreaking must it be to evacuate knowing that your home may not be there when you come back? Dense smoke turns noon into night as more than 80,000 people try to leave Fort McMurray all on the same day. If it succeeds, the evacuation will be the largest in Alberta's history. Failure is unthinkable. And you have no idea whether you're gonna make it or not. Heaven forbid a big giant pine tree that's on fire falls across the road. If it does, they're all gonna burn. Wind is the demon fanning the flames. It bedevils everyone, those trying to escape and those staying behind to battle the flames. The wind changed constantly. We'd be set up in one place, the wind would blow into another direction. We'd have to try to anticipate where it was gonna be and make sure we had the right trucks there. It was advancing so quickly, they couldn't get ahead of it. It was changing direction and they couldn't surround it. The wind has other malevolent tricks. It shoots burning embers out from the flames, allowing the main fire to spread. The embers definitely added a level of unpredictability. If an ember rains down, it finds a good source of fuel and some oxygen, it's gonna start a new fire. When you get very windy conditions and you have fire as well, that's gonna spread that fire and can grow it exponentially large. An airport security cam catches the fire's explosive growth. And this is over a period of hours, not days, not weeks. I mean, it looks like Armageddon. The fire's billowing smoke looks remarkably like a thunderstorm. In fact, fires and storms can be linked by more than just appearance. A fire creates its own weather system because that fire is so hot. And when you have the hot air that's superheated, it goes in one direction and goes straight up. And then the fire is burning through brush that has at least some moisture that's being added into the air. That's rising as well, but eventually it's going to run into cooler air aloft. And you can get clouds to form called pyrocumulus clouds. The Fort McMurray fire is a gargantuan weather event. The blaze generates its own thunderstorm, complete with lightning. The fire is closing in on this house. A wall-mounted camera linked to a cell phone shows its arrival. I don't know if I'd necessarily want to watch my house burn live on my cell. Everything in a home has meaning, and to watch it just get run down by a fire is really heartbreaking. You can actually hear the the fire alarm going off, that's scary. Flames destroy electrical wiring in the house. You almost wonder, is it better to just go back and see that it burned down than actually have to watch it burn down? This house is among thousands of Fort McMurray homes and buildings destroyed by the fire. The Fort McMurray fire seems of almost biblical proportions. It humbles a city with flames, wind, and lightning, forces an exodus of thousands, and exacts an economic toll of billions. But scientists say this astonishing fire is just a prophecy of disasters to come. Parts of Western Canada have gradually been getting drier over the last few decades in response to climate change. One of the byproducts of that is a statistically increasing number of of fires. This is insane. Almost certainly, 
we will be tested in the future. But in May of 2016, Fort McMurray proved a miracle is still possible. 88,000 people needed to flee the city. Two were killed in a traffic accident. Everyone else got out alive. But I think in Fort McMurray, you saw the best in humanity, a uh, whole community getting together uh, to, to make sure everybody got out safe. Burning embers from a large forest fire can drift more than a mile. The fire that burned Fort McMurray easily jumped the Athabasca River, which is more than a quarter mile wide. Some 3,000 miles east of Fort McMurray, Iceland pokes up from the North Atlantic Ocean. Though one of the world's smallest countries, Iceland is as beautiful as any place on Earth. A highway encircling the island leads to its many wonders. But here, winter driving comes with serious risks. So I already know this is going to be a dangerous situation. Whoa! That's not good. Head on like that. When you look at that collision, the force of it, you're thinking, my goodness, someone was really seriously injured in this. Luckily, they weren't, but that could have been a lot worse. Two people are in this car, only a driver's in the oncoming vehicle. It's all about being a defensive driver, and there was really no place for them to go because it looks like if they went off the road, that could have been problematic as well. It's obviously a very thin road, barely two lanes. The roadway is elevated above the other areas. Where it's going to be cooler, like a bridge would be cooler. This was very icy conditions here. There's no way that these cars should have been moving at this rate of speed. And once you start fishtailing, you have no control. Cars on icy roads require 10 times the distance to stop. At 60 miles per hour on a dry road, a car will stop in about 130 feet. On ice, the same car will need about 1,200 feet, about a quarter of a mile. Moral of the story, drive slow on icy roads. And the last thing you want to do if you're sliding and you lose control of your car is to slam on the brakes because that's going to cause you to spin even more. You want to point your steering wheel in the direction you want to go and press the brakes, but don't slam on it. Coming up, a tornado tears a town apart in Southeast Asia. It turns into a very dangerous situation very quickly. And a couple trapped by this tornado discusses how to stay safe. I'm not getting out of the car. Forget that. No, I'm not. In a ditch. No, I'm not. When Weather Gone Viral continues.
Oh, yeah. Calm down. A tornado is about the last thing you want to see hanging outside your front windshield. But that's what a husband and wife are facing as they cower in their car along North Carolina's Highway 264. Oh my God. Calm down. So the husband just cracks me up. I mean, what a good guy calming down his wife while she is freaking out, rightly so. There's a tornado right in front of them. They clearly were in danger. They don't know where it's moving to. There's an increasing chance of stormy weather inside the car as well. If the winds pick up, we'll get out and land this ditch. You don't land a f ditch? Oh my god! Yes, oh my god, oh my god, no I'm not! In a ditch. No, I'm not! I'm not getting out of the car! No, I'm not! If you've got a ditch nearby, it's deep enough, it's not full of water where you're gonna drown, it might be a viable option, but your car also offers protection. Baby, I'm not getting out of the car. You just want to duck down because debris could be passing through the windows, so you just want to get at the lowest level of the car possible. And if the winds pick up and lots of shit starts flying, we have to get out of this glass oh and close. Oh my god. You know, we might have to get out of the car and lay on the ground. Oh my god. We're in a glass cage. Why are you rolling the window down? Equalize pressure inside the car in case we have to open the door. No one equalizes the pressure anymore. That's what we did back in the 60s. That's not what we do today. The problem is, is your whole vehicle going to be pushed on, rolled? Is it going to be picked up by the updrafts of the tornado and tossed and bounced across the countryside? Opening the windows, that's not something you need to be really worried about. Oh, my God, baby! Oh, my God, come on! Calm down. Besides tornado survival, the couple's predicament raises a related safety issue, whether to tell someone to calm down. Listen, the reality is nobody likes to be told to calm down when they're freaking out. You don't want to be told, calm down. It's the worst. I think later on, he probably is going to be in trouble, but in that moment, I think it was the right advice. I don't know what that conversation was like afterwards. <laughs> oh God, I think it's coming near us. If you've ever been cornered by a tornado, you know there's nothing better than watching it get smaller in your car's rear window. Tornadoes have rolled through every one of the United States and numerous countries. Weather conditions in Antarctica could theoretically generate a tornado, but not one has ever been documented there. June 11th, 2008. Can't see, bad area. Two friends hit the road in Harrison County, Iowa. What happens next? Think you know the answer? Okay, here we go. Oh, this looks great. The two are storm chasers, hunting a tornado predicted for the region. There it is. Is that rain wrapped? Uh, it could be a rain wrapped wedge. One of the most dangerous weather phenomena is a tornado obscured by rain. You don't know what's coming. You won't know it until it's on top of you. If they do find the tornado, one of the chasers will report it live from the scene for local TV. They're on the flanks of the tornado and probably moving into it unwittingly. How about the stuff that's uh, falling down? Oh my and God, the lightning was you can see he has some debris flying around. Maybe that's the only clue you have before you meet up with the tornado. Oh, here oh, it is right we're, here. In the we're in the tornado. We're in right the now. tornado. Our ears are popping. My ears are popping. Our ears are popping. The tornado is right over us right now. Holy smokes. Their ears are popping because they are right inside the tornadic circulation, where the pressure is dramatically lower than surrounding areas. We are in the tornado. The just went right over, over us. us. In the tornado. We are in the tornado. In the tornado. I've been that close before. It's not the right place to be. I don't know if you can hear me with these high winds. It's going high. 100 mile hour wind around your car right now. There's tree limbs down everywhere. A glass window in the vehicle is not going to protect you from a two by four or a tree branch that's coming in at 90 miles an hour. It's going to come right through the windshield. Well, we have, yeah, I'm still here if you want to take me live. The tornado went right over the top of us 
The two chasers survive the tornado, which they find at the end of its run. By then, the twister has wound down from its high of EF3. It is normal for tornadoes to progress in intensity. They start out sometimes narrow and weak, or kind of broad and swirling, and then they concentrate and intensify. You don't know until afterwards that death and destruction has occurred. The tornado struck at the Little Sioux Scout Ranch. There, it destroyed several buildings and killed four teenage Boy Scouts. Along with the tornado's 14-mile path through western Iowa, 48 other people escaped with only injuries. Tornadoes are one of the most shocking forces on our planet. The vast majority are made in the USA. This dash cam video captures one of the rare exceptions. The daily afternoon rain is just letting up across this industrial town in Vietnam. It just looks like they're out there, you know, selling their goods, maybe a little market right there. Boy, can you imagine the people going down the street here? I mean, this type of weather is exceptionally rare for Southeastern Asia. Gusting wind is just a hint of what's coming. It turns into a very dangerous situation very quickly. Look at that guy on that scooter. And it looks like he's trying to make it through. And then eventually, that tornado just knocks him right off his scooter. And then he's making a run for it. Oh, no! Big pieces of debris are flying across. Probably that's going to be sheet metal. And if that sheet metal hits you, it could cut you into pieces. It's hard to tell how strong this tornado was, but it was certainly more than a match for many of these buildings in the area. No deaths were reported from the tornado. But this was a rare weather event. People here may be talking about it for years. Debris from dozens of tornadoes has been found five or more miles from the vortex. The infamous Ruskin Heights tornado in May 1957 tossed debris 165 miles. It also blew debris so high, it was seen by pilots flying at 30,000 feet, nearly six miles above the Earth. Coming up. Oh. Oh, no. A flood swollen river inside the house. This is a situation you don't want to be in. And mountains move when soggy Earth meets the force of gravity. When weather gone viral continues.
In May of 2015, rainfall in parts of southwest Texas reaches 300% of normal. The land is saturated, the rivers rising. On Saturday the 23rd, the Perez family arrives for a weekend vacation in Wimberley, Texas, near the Blanco River. By Saturday night, oh! Oh no! the Blanco is in their living room. I can't even imagine what that must have felt like to have basically a river in your house. This is a situation you don't want to be in. Oh, oh no! Do I need to worry that this water is going to keep coming higher? Because obviously now you can't get out of your house unless you go out a window, but then you're going to find yourself in this raging water. You'd be tumbled, you'd go underwater, you might hit something, chances are uh, you're not going to survive. Almost like a warning, the flood snuffs out a table lamp. Oh, no. They're stuck on the second floor. There's literally nothing this family can do is just hope that flash flood does not actually tear apart their house. We talk about these thunderstorms dropping a ton of rainfall over a short period of time. And that's exactly what happened here. The river depth was stable at five feet for several days. But late on May 23rd, the level rises five feet every 15 minutes, 20 feet in one hour. By the time it breaks into this house, the Blanco is over 40 feet deep, a new record. If you don't have a second floor, where are you going? The rush subsides, but that's little comfort. We're OK, all right? We're OK. We're going to be OK. It has got to just be an absolutely unnerving experience. The Blanco River took 12 lives that night. But the Perez family escaped through a second story window and onto a rescue boat. How much do you know about the historic Texas rains of May 2015? Thirty-seven trillion gallons is enough rain to drown the entire state of Texas in ankle-deep water, more than a quarter million square miles. Rain takes center stage again, this time in Changxi Province, China. During July of 2013, the region is battered by heavy storms. What happens next? Think you know the answer? Wow, what's weird about this is that it's not the whole hillside. You just have that one channel when all of this was coming down the hillside. All those rocks, those aren't coming one at a time. It's coming all at once. Did a guy just get out of that car? Watching this, you think, why doesn't he go back and help? Well, really, would you do that? I don't blame him at all, I don't. We don't know how we're gonna react in any situation until we're in that situation. Oh, the person climbing out of the car is throwing themselves out. He looks back and screams to his friends, you gotta get out of there. And more people start to come out of the vehicle. Four men were in the car and somehow they all survived but there's someone else who narrowly escapes. Look at the guy also walking with an umbrella. Right at the beginning of the video, he was just a few feet past where this slide went, so, whew. He's still alive because of very lucky timing. But the survival of the men in the car is harder to explain. That's not an armored troop carrier. That's a sedan. The thing was crushed. The fact that they all got out, it really is a miracle. That is some serious shit right there, boy. In almost every corner of the earth. It's gonna hit the shock. Watch out. Every moment of every day. Damn. Oh my God. Cameras are rolling on the most heart-stopping. Gut-wrenching. 
awe-inspiring. This is insane. Weather out there. We don't really know how to react. Look at that, dude. So we wind up mesmerized. You can't pull away. This is reality TV. You think you know your weather? Our team breaks down the science behind the storm. You can see the water flowing into the vortex. Inside the most shocking viral videos that will blow your mind. Weathering the weather usually means an umbrella, rubber boots, or a wool coat. Until the weather turns extreme. If you're trapped inside a tornado, trying not to drown in a flash flood, or traveling through a cyclone, only superhuman courage. Holy or a very lucky break can help you weather this kind of weather. Texas has its own brand of bad weather. Storms here feed on warm, moisture-laden air from the Gulf of Mexico, and that can turn them into heartless killers. They sometimes just sit over the same areas, and then they just dump the rain, dump the rain, and before you know it, you've got some roadways that now look like rapids. April 29th, 2017, Myrtle Springs, Texas. Yet another storm promises a horrific tragedy. Need some help? A car flipped over in the floodwaters, and there are people trapped inside. Passers-by have left the safety of their own cars to help with a rescue. If you can hear thunder, no matter where you are, you're close enough to get struck by lightning. So these guys are risking their lives to save this family right now. Everybody is at risk of losing their life. You've got kids, you know, a toddler, a baby, strapped into their seats in the back of this car. The vehicle is filling up with water, and time is really of the essence. Finally, rescuers managed to free the baby from the flooded wreck. You see that one gentleman in the red shirt carrying that baby, and as a mother, this just tugs at my heartstrings because right now that baby does not look well at all. While a few rescuers try to revive the baby, others pull a second child, a toddler, from the wreck. So you've got a baby and a toddler and they're trying everything to, to make sure that they're okay. Truly disturbing video. For a brief moment, both children are visible as the rescuers try frantically to revive them. And even the cameraman ends up putting his camera down to actually give this baby CPR to help it survive. He puts the phone down for a second. You can see the top of the child's head, but what you really want to do is listen. You can hear how precarious the situation actually is. Come on, baby. Come on. In the name of Jesus. Come on. Let him breathe, Lord. Miss Moore. Let him breathe, Lord. Ooh, it's tough to listen to that. Incredibly, the two children are resuscitated and the mother and father are safely pulled from the wreck. All survived, but only because total strangers came to their rescue. All of these guys, they could have gotten struck by lightning, maybe even drowned, but they risked their own lives to save this family. Even in the worst of weather, it's amazing to see what people will do. This storm flooded open country, but torrential rains can also threaten cities. 
Urban areas are more likely to flood because of heavy runoff produced by extensive pavement. 7,500 miles due east of Myrtle Springs, a freak cold spell holds the city of Wuhu, China in an icy grip. And for people not familiar with Wuhu, China, uh, this is south of Beijing. It's at about latitude 31 degrees. And for it to freeze, this is a very, very rare event. Most people make adjustments for the icy roads, but not the truck driver in this harrowing dash cam video. The truck driver is actually trying to pass another car. Guy on the motorcycle has no traction, he slips. Even the guy's helmet gets flung off. Oh no, you gotta be kidding me. Please tell me that guy's all right. I can't believe this, look at him. He's just like, all right, getting up. That kind of hurt a little, but I think I'm okay. The drivers jump out and they're freaking out. They probably were thinking, oh my gosh, for sure enough, this guy is a goner. And instead he's right there. He just kind of shakes himself off. He goes into his back pocket, takes his phone out, and he's dialing someone, probably his lawyer. Not even a lawyer could explain how this man survives, but the weather may be a factor. This was all pretty much a frictionless surface. He just slides with that truck. He even gets a cushion from the snow that's piled up on the side of the road, and that saved his life too. That is absolutely miraculous. Miraculous. Far from icy roads and passing trucks, four friends climb a web of cables and rungs anchored to bare rock. It's known as a via ferrata, an iron way. A sudden rain drums hard on the climber's helmet. What happens next? Think you know the answer? Lightning strike isn't a direct hit, but it's way too close for comfort. There was no delay at all between the flash and the thunder, meaning that it was right in the vicinity. Holy <laughs> Well, we almost just died, probably. It is not a stretch to say that they almost died. That was some scary The climbers cling to the rock and to the cable for dear life. Yet either one can deliver a shock from lightning. The most common way for someone to be injured by lightning is what's known as the ground current, where lightning strikes the ground and the charge spreads out, and someone can be struck by lightning that way, even without being directly struck. Lightning can travel through the ground or along the ground as far as 60 yards. The metal cables embedded in the cliff may have also picked up a charge from the rock itself. Could very well be that some of the charge got into the cabling and that can travel very easily through metal and then manage to shock the climber. Uh, I'm gonna get off this. Oh God. Okay. Oh. Finally, all four climbers reach a cave, lucky to have survived without injury. We need a group hug. <laughs> they were darn close to meeting their maker right there. Coming up, can a skier survive a thousand foot fall? Oh my goodness. And surfing a killer wave the size of a building. When Weather Gone Viral continues.
Angel Collinson's bold moves have made her one of the most sought after skiers on the planet. In January of 2015, a film crew scooped her up to shoot a ski action movie in Alaska's rugged Neocola Mountains. Oh, she's ripping it. I mean, absolutely ripping this shoot. Look at that, look at that. The crew films Collinson from a chopper while a helmet cam records her view. Oh. Whoa, whoa, whoa. oh my goodness. Holy Collinson falls a thousand feet, but suffers only bruises and jammed fingers. I'm okay. I'm okay. It seems that weather may have derailed Collinson's run through the chute. You get a nice patch, you skis go out from under you. You're done. It's some icy, chunky snow. It's not like the powder she was on before. Despite the fall, Collinson's other rides were chosen for the film's climactic final sequence. Skiers continually push the limits of speed. They can now accelerate faster than a race car. At a race on March 26th, 2016, Ivan Oregana of Italy hit a speed of 158 miles per hour. He accelerated to 125 miles per hour in 5.5 seconds, faster than a Formula One race car at the starting line. Minnesota has no huge peaks like Alaska. Its highest spot is barely above 2,000 feet, but its winters are icy cold and its many lakes typically freeze. It's not exactly breaking news. But a TV station did air this photo and posted it on its Facebook page. It shows one of three deer marooned on the frozen surface of Albert Lee Lake, some 50 miles south of Minneapolis. The owners of a local hovercraft company see the photo and decide to take action. This is a, a decent sized lake here in Minnesota. These deer were stuck about a thousand feet inside from the, the edge of the lake. Deer can actually walk on ice, but the way their hooves are, if they actually slip and fall, they basically have no way of getting back up. No traction at all whatsoever. These guys know that they can get on the ice. They're experienced in the area. They know it's safe enough to be out there. And they're like, all right, we've got the gear to do this. Let's get these animals off the ice. So these deer were stuck out here for a couple of days. This wouldn't have ended well. Get it. Towing turns out to be the easy part of the rescue. <sighs> The deer were actually so weak when they brought them to the edge of the lake, they actually had to lift them up and carry them. All right. Don't kick me in the Don't kick me in the And then they got to do it all over again. Another 1,000 feet back in to rescue the next deer, and then another 1,000 feet back. Oh, look at that one. Get a video of that, Dad. Don't go anywhere. There you go. Get up there, there you go. Yeah! In the end, all three deer were brought to safety. People are good, aren't they? People are good. Yeah! Falling into icy water is always dangerous and sometimes fatal. New clear ice must be at least four inches thick to safely support foot traffic. White ice or snow ice is half as strong and must be at least eight inches thick to be safe. Surfing turns weather into fun by harnessing the wind and storm power locked in a wave. This is off the coast of Portugal, where they are known for the massive waves. And you can see just how monstrous these waves can get, even up to 30, 40, 50 feet tall. I mean, we're talking the size of an office building. A pro surfer named Pedro Viana grabbed this towering monster at Nazare on March 28, 2016. 
He's moving very fast, I and mean, he's probably doing 40, 50 miles per hour. That's a pretty monstrous wave to try to navigate all the way through before the wave comes crashing in. You can see how violent this crash is, I and mean, when he falls, he is just tossed about. This guy had no chance if he's out there by himself. These are huge waves, <laughs> and you're not just gonna swim out of them. A fellow surfer with a jet ski can retrieve Viana before the next wave, but the timing must be perfect. So now another wave is coming, and they've gotta quickly get out of the way. The jet ski goes down, it capsizes in that second big wave. Suddenly the rescuer and the rescuee are both in the water, and they need help. So now you've got a third surfer who comes to the rescue on yet another jet ski, and he is keeping a close eye on those waves. The jet ski can only carry one person. The rescuer chooses the furthest out. Viana will be rescued next, if he can be found. Time is of the essence. But while Viana waits, waves could crush him against the nearby rocks. After leaving the first surfer on shore, the jet ski slips in between waves and speeds Viana to safety. Kudos to that jet skier. He is able to not just rescue one of his mates, but both of them. Viana survived his close call with gigantic waves and sharp rocks. He and his friends will be back out tomorrow, surfing the big ones. Coming up, this desperate attempt to escape a flash flood. This is not going to end well and a horrific road collapse when Weather Gone Viral continues.
Pakistan is a mountainous country, and driving can be terrifying, even in good weather. Cars and trucks face miles of tortuous hairpin turns on narrow dirt roads through high mountain passes. Some roads are passable during dry months of the year. But then, the monsoon season blows in. In the monsoon season, you can get tons of rain, um, unlike anything we really get in the United States. And a lot of times they bring very epic flooding. During the monsoon, this is what can happen to those who press their luck on Highway N45. It's like a Hollywood movie. Can they get everyone out of that bus before the bus goes down the river? Because you know it's going. When I see that, I'm thinking, this is not going to end well. It's completely unstable, but it just seems like it's one person after another after another getting out of that bus. I'm surprised that as fast as this water was flowing, that some of them didn't lose their balance and get swept away down over the rapids. It's extremely lucky that these people made it to shore safely. In their rush to escape, the passengers leave something behind. One guy left, but he's in a pretty hopeless situation right there. The edge of that van is likely to be extremely slippery. One wrong move, if he sways that, that bus at all, this thing's going down the river. And he's going to climb up to the top of the vehicle, back up to that top ledge. It's just incredible to me that he, he and all the others made it safely. The monsoon season is an annual weather event, but it happens at different times of the year in different locations. Pakistan lies in the path of the southwest monsoon, which brings torrential rains June through September, the summer months. Two continents away, the South American monsoon system brings epic flooding to Brazil. The major road through northwest Brazil, the Trans-Amazon Highway, is mostly unpaved. Monsoon rains often disrupt travel. And at times, the rains can be deadly. So we're in Brazil in the Trans-Amazon Highway, and a lot of rain has been falling. And you've got this tremendous water flow here that is eating away at the ground underneath that road. You could see that back tire was stuck and was starting to sink. The driver here feels something going wrong. The bus driver has the foresight to get everyone off the bus. And look at how fortunate they were to get those people off that bus, because it's going to be devoured. And it just goes into the floodwaters. Wow. The disaster could have been so much bigger had everyone still been on that bus. Passengers would have been thrown from their seats and slammed around inside the bus. The bus will float for a little bit, but there's all kinds of entry points for that water, and eventually it would have filled with water, and it would probably not be above water for long. You really needed to be off the bus before this happened. And luckily, everyone was. Coming up, a couple trapped with each other in a tornado. This is cool! And they seem to be at odds on what to do here. And the fury of a cyclone. Oh my gosh. Fuels a high stakes rescue. When Weather Gone Viral continues.
In Kansas, tornadoes grow like weeds, big ones. Kansas is uniquely situated in the traditional tornado alley. You get moist air out of the Gulf, you get dry air from the plains, and you get cold air from the north. Some of the most violent storms on Earth are located in the central plains of the United States. On May 28, 2013, a couple encounters one of these violent Kansas storms about 100 miles north of Wichita. And they look out the window, and there is this huge tornado off to the right of the car. We can see the wedge shape there. Right there. Look at the freaking clouds above it. We're in 80 mile an hour winds right here. Get out of here. Oh my gosh, we are in a tornado right now. Yeah. I think they made what could have been a deadly mistake here. You might get killed by driving into the tornado. The man is driving and giddy with excitement, but the woman is terrified. This is cool! Yeah. Oh my God, stop! Oh my God, Jesus! Oh Lord, Jesus! Look at the way that the wind is blowing across the street, perpendicular to the vehicle. So that vehicle could easily be rolled. That is really violent. That is really blowing. The one thing they could have done that they didn't do is they could have turned their car to face the direction of the wind. You've got a much greater chance of your car staying on the ground if it's facing the wind, which is designed to do. Is there a road right here I can turn on? I can't see. I can't see. Oh, Jesus. There's a road right there. Oh, but I don't want to go that way. I want to go home. I want to go home. And they seem to be at odds on what to do here. At the end of their harrowing ride through the tornado, the couple finally reaches home safely. He took a chance here because he thought it was a thrill. <laughs> Get close to them. <laughs> I've never heard you pray like that. That was crazy. More tornadoes hit the United States than anywhere else on the planet, and Kansas ranks among the top three states with the most twisters. On average, 60 tornadoes will rip through Kansas each year. Powerful tornadoes also rough up America's southern tier, from Alabama to Georgia and up into North Carolina. That region is called Dixie Alley. Twisters there can be just as vicious as those in the more famous Tornado Alley. One of them hit Shaw University in Raleigh, North Carolina on April 16, 2011. The stairwells would be the safest place to be. Or once you got into a place that was away from the windows, you were generally pretty safe. When I saw this, I'm like, this is pure chaos right here. Here we have a lot. A tornado right now going up. Look at all the debris flying around out there, and uh, it's that debris. That's the stuff that can hurt you. The cameraman here was clearly pretty excited and going from one location to another and he's saying, wow, I've got to try to document this. This is so university right here. It's just fascinating. He basically takes us into the immediate aftermath. We got leaks. We don't always see it from the human perspective on the ground and eyes that are actually just experience this. Oh my God. All the offices is done and everything. Oh God. Oh my God. Oh God. We're seeing complete rooms just destroyed and demolished. Oh man. Whew. 
thing. You can see outside and everything. You can feel the stress of the situation, and it, they're obviously just really, really impacted. Everything is done. Everything is done. The buildings themselves are not likely to topple, but the strong winds of the tornado in this case broke the windows. Everybody's windows busted open. Everybody's window is busted open. You don't want to be anywhere with windows because look what happens. Shaw's 2,300 students escape without serious injury, but the school itself is hit hard. Every building suffered some kind of damage. The school was closed for the rest of the school year, suffered more than $3 million worth of damage. The repairs will be completed in four months. Then students can return and begin putting the tornado behind them. Great Britain averages just 34 tornadoes per year. But Britain's so small that when you do the math, it has 70% more tornadoes per square mile than the United States. Cyclones can pack even greater destructive power than tornadoes. They form at sea, then wreak absolute havoc on land. December 12th, 2016. Cyclone Varda makes landfall in Chennai, India. In a matter of hours, Varda uproots trees, rips apart buildings, and sends 8,000 terrified residents to emergency shelters. Lives are in danger across the city. Several people take refuge in this parking structure. A good place to be is in a parking garage, so these people are shielded from the wind here. A bus driver has the same idea. You've got these people trying to direct the bus into this parking garage, but the bus is having trouble, struggling, trying to just even make a turn. When you have winds like this, probably 75, 80 miles per hour here, uh, maybe more than that in gusts, uh, that's enough to, oh my gosh. The wind just, oh, it's like slow motion. Look at this. These people are trying to run out of there. Amidst the heavy rain and wind, these people are in real trouble. The bystanders on the side are doing whatever they can to save the people on the bus. They take their shawls and they tie them together like a rope and they pull these people out of the bus one by one. They're risking their lives, being toppled over by the wind, getting hit by debris. One of these people could easily get killed. Look at all these people putting their lives in danger for these strangers on a bus. During its rampage through Chennai, Cyclone Varda killed 10 people. But everyone on this bus and their rescuers survived the ordeal. Tropical cyclones always form over the ocean. From there, some storm the coast. Making landfall means the eye of the cyclone has reached the coast. Coming up, winter weather surprises commuters. That hurts. And snarls traffic. When weather gone viral continues.
two fearsome days. Winter storm Stella unleashed a massive snowfall on the Northeast United States. It shut down cities, downed power lines, and forced Amtrak and other systems to cancel trains. Stella was one of these winter storms that was large enough and powerful enough to affect millions and millions of people with not just inches of snow, but feet of snow. By March 16th, Stella is gone. Trains are back on schedule and commuters return to work. But at this Amtrak station in Rhinecliff, New York, evidence of Stella's turbulent visit still remains. These people are standing on the platform waiting for the train, but look at how much snow is covering where it looks like the tracks would be. And these people waiting on the platform, they have uh, got quite the show awaiting them. Oh my gosh, look how heavy and how much snow that is. That is dangerous. These people got blasted with snow. It's gonna be like getting hit with a piece of plywood. <laughs> This is a morning train, and all these people are a little groggy. Everybody just woke up. Remarkably, a second person recorded the same event. So the woman you see, she's dressed for the conditions, right? She's got her winter hat on. She's probably not so sure about what's about to happen, though. This is the time where you probably should be backing away. Even if there's no snow on the track, you probably shouldn't be standing that close anyway. But nope, oh, still there. That hurts. That hurts. Now, here's another example of being so absorbed what we're seeing on our cell phones that we don't see this gigantic train. But then, when that snow starts to fly into the air, it still takes a few milliseconds for her to react to it. I imagine she's on her phone writing, OMG, where is this train? It's running late. She's not looking because the train is here, and it is hitting a ton of snow. And that snow just bang! That train was not coming in for a stop. That train was going on through. Amtrak officials say the train was moving at the authorized speed. Fortunately, no one was injured. Winter storm Stella dropped three to nearly five feet of snow in parts of the Northeast. Winter storm Stella threw down snow at an astonishing rate of seven inches per hour in Ilion, New York. Anything over an inch and a half is ranked as high. In Montreal, Canada, it doesn't take a titanic storm like Stella to create problems. This is a city of hills, so an ordinary snowfall can unleash total chaos. On a hill, when it's super slick like this, the tires are just going to automatically go wherever gravity takes them. Unfortunately, gravity always wins. This is Beaver Hall Hill. This is a known area for this type of sliding to happen during an ice storm or a snowstorm. Car after car after car, nobody's able to stop. There's a bunch of stopped cars crashed at the bottom. Even the police get caught up in this mess. No one knows how to drive in the snow and the ice. It's just one of those things. Cars are not built to be driving around on those surfaces. These cars, and buses for that matter, are locking their tires, and they're just standing on the brake. Once you're sliding, you have to give those tires a chance to re-grip the road. The taxi is able to stop, and it's because the taxi doesn't lock its wheels. It is trying to drive still, and so it then gains a little bit of friction and is able to then turn. But most drivers just hold down the brake, and gravity takes over. Here comes the vehicle, which is supposed to plow and put down salt and cinders, and it has no control. Okay, when the plows can't do it, no one needs to be out there. None of these drivers was seriously injured, but this pileup is a reminder that driving in icy roads don't mix, especially on hills. All sorts of vehicles lose traction on that icy hill in Montreal. 
Are there any that wouldn't slide? When driven without regard to icy conditions, a four-wheel drive vehicle slides just as easily as a two-wheel drive. Only safe driving can prevent skidding. In Montreal, an icy street was a threat. Here in Krasnoyarsk, Siberia, it's a lifesaver. Oh my God. Those few seconds of him falling allowed him not to get hit by that car, and that car was going fast. Basically, the ice saved his life. It's unlikely that this uh, oncoming car on the left side, left hand lane here had any idea that there might be someone moving out in front of him. Never looked. Thank goodness there was a little icy patch there that he slipped on, because otherwise, this would have had a totally different ending. Coming up, a gust of wind takes down a billboard. <gasps> that just fell on top of a car. And we slip in another story about winter ice. <laughs> when Weather Gone Viral continues.
Scientists have been uncovering weather secrets for generations. But weather always has another surprise. March 9, 2016, 30 miles east of Mexico City. We have what appears to be a very large billboard. Oh my gosh. <gasps> that just fell on top of a car. <laughs> wow. This big billboard does come down and hit at least one car, so it's very fortunate that the occupants of the car weren't smashed and killed. In all, four people were injured, one seriously. It seems the cause may be a mix of weather and people. If you look at it really closely at the bottom, you can see that they're trying to hold up the pole with these little two by fours, like they knew there was something going on at the base of the pole, or why would you put braces on it? Those signs are anchored more securely to the ground. Yes, it's windy, and you can see the flags blowing, but it doesn't seem like it's that strong. But wind doesn't blow uniformly. Things like this can happen where you have something fail just based on that little bit of an additional wind that comes with a gust that comes along randomly. I'm not sure how you avoid that. You could be driving along. The last thing you expect is a giant 80-foot sign to come falling down the middle of the road. I'm so glad that everybody's OK, because this could have gone a completely different direction. The National Weather Service doesn't measure gusts unless the prevailing wind speed is at least 18 miles per hour. Tropical cyclone Olivia gusted at 253 miles per hour when it crossed over Australia's Barrow Island on April 10, 1996. It was the highest wind gust speed ever recorded on planet Earth. As it had in Mexico, the weather defied expectations in Los Angeles, this time with a freak rainstorm on October 15, 2015. The sudden deluge triggered mudslides and shut down highways. Hundreds of cars were trapped in sludge. Road crews scoop up the mess and traffic returns to normal on most highways. But above Vasquez Canyon Road, a waterlogged slope slowly and quietly begins to move. The ground didn't have enough traction and basically slid down, went under the road, and caused it to buckle up like that. The road is just sitting on the earth, so when the earth moves, so is the road going to move, and it's not going to be able to stay together. Vasquez Canyon Road is closed to traffic, but it's not abandoned. Impromptu skate park right there on the broken road. Hey, at this point, what else is it good for? It's kind of resourceful by these uh, skaters. I'm not sure how safe this is, but it's kind of cool to watch. This is not uh, a skate park that has been designed structurally sound, okay? Not a risk-free activity here. It will take a year of work and $4 million before Vasquez Canyon is given back to cars and trucks. But for a while, skateboarders rule this bootleg amusement park. To restore Vasquez Canyon Road, Work crews removed some 58,000 cubic yards of earth from the slide area. A cubic yard of soil weighs between two and 3,000 pounds, depending on its texture, moisture content, and other factors. 58,000 cubic yards adds up to more than a billion pounds. From extreme rain and road destruction in Los Angeles, to an icy driveway during a Canadian winter. It seems quite ordinary. But what isn't ordinary is for someone to have this much difficulty getting into a car. Even on an icy driveway. She's walking like a baby giraffe, you know, trying to find your footing and, you know, legs are going every which way. It's like me in high heels. All I need to hear is the videographer laughing and it makes me laugh too. <laughs> what I'm guessing is the friend saw her leaving, saw, all right, doesn't look like she's quite got this. Let's record it. 
thankfully there weren't a lot of cameras around when I was trying to accomplish that very thing. There are other ways of getting across an ice slicked surface. Go take some salt from inside. Just throw some of that salt out there. Something to melt that top layer. So now instead of just having a flat, frictionless surface, you've got little pock marks in the, in the ice where that can give you maybe just a little bit of grip. Maybe salt is something for next year. <laughs> but for now, the woman is finally off the ice. My guess is this is a person that's not super familiar with snow and ice. So here's hoping her driving on the ice was a little better than her walking. That is some serious sh right there, boy. In almost every corner of the earth. It's gonna hit the shock. Watch out. Every moment of every day. Damn. Oh my God. Cameras are rolling on the most heart-stopping, gut-wrenching, oh awe-inspiring. This is insane. Weather out there. We don't really know how to react. Look at that, dude. So we wind up mesmerized. You can't pull away. This is reality TV. You think you know your weather? Our team breaks down the science behind the storm. You can see the water flowing into the vortex. Inside the most shocking viral videos that will blow your mind. Ingenuity is perhaps the most powerful force in human evolution. But today's innovators are facing a serious challenge. Our world is changing, and many of us are focused on that looming threat and the fragile health of planet Earth. It's not obvious what all of the solutions will be to the problems that we're facing, and it's been the willingness of tinkerers, experimentalists, innovators to try things out, see what works, and continue pushing forward. Our inventive thinkers and countless others are inspired by the most urgent challenge in human history, saving the planet. Inventors look at life creatively. They see what isn't there, but could be. To Lawrence Kemble Cook, a crowd of people is powerful, literally. What if we could harness a small amount of energy from every single person walking, we could store that energy in batteries and then use it to power cities of the future? Kemble Cook has invented a tile system that harnesses foot-powered clean energy. His company is called PaveGen. Each step drives a tiny electromagnetic generator inside the tile. PaveGen says its current V3 model puts out five watts of clean energy per step. What could make any more sense than taking our everyday activity, um, walking around and finding ways to draw upon the energy that that generates? In 2014, Kemble Cook brings PaveGen to Rio de Janeiro, but he dodges the ritzy side of town and heads to one of the city's impoverished backwaters known as favelas. What was really interesting is some of the local children got involved in the project. They helped us install our energy tiles. They helped us test it. They were jumping on it. They could see the light. They could really see what the energy was doing. The pressure of their feet on the panels on this soccer field is actually generating the energy needed to light up that uh, soccer. Uh, stadium. Um, so they're literally making their own power. Word spread what was going on. It was really great to empower that community you know, with the power of First Step United. The tiles work exactly as planned, and they're still lighting the soccer field today. These developing economies is where we can show massive impact from the power of Foot Step. Two years after Rio, PaveGen scores another coup an installation in Washington, D.C., just down the street from the White House. People are the solution. So every time you walk on a tile, you are generating energy for your city. You're making your city greener. PaveGen has more than 200 installations worldwide. The tiles are especially useful in countries with little or no electric grid. What's appealing about what they are doing and what so many other companies are doing is that innovation has to start somewhere. 
And if everybody does a little bit, it's going to achieve a groundswell. We've got a, a big client issue ahead of us. And so we need to be coming together, best, the best minds working together to find solutions that can actually improve the world we live in. PaveGen relies on big crowds to generate energy. How many footsteps does it take to power a 100 watt light bulb for 14 hours? Those same two million footsteps will power an equivalent LED light for nearly three days. All inventors push the limits of what is known, but the reason they push can vary. For Anne Makasinski, it's personal. I am half Filipino and half Polish, so I have cousins and family in the Philippines. Uh, so we went to a small village in the Philippines where my mom grew up, and I made one friend there. My friend in the Philippines told me that she one day had failed her grade in school because she couldn't afford electricity, and so she had no light to study with at night. And it really shocked me that someone just my age, just in a completely different part of the world, didn't have something as simple as light. Anne sets a goal for her 10th grade science project. Design a light that doesn't need batteries or power from the grid. I first read that humans are described as 100 watt walking light bulbs. We have the potential to generate so much electricity in the form of heat. So it kind of just made sense. I was like, oh, well, she needs a flashlight. Let's try human heat. To capture and convert energy for her flashlight, Anne chooses a component called a Peltier tile. A Peltier tile has two dissimilar metals and they have a bunch of tiny little junctions and they're sandwiched, in my case, in between two ceramic plates. And if you heat one side of this plate and you cool the other side, it will produce electricity because of the way the metals and the electrons inside are reacting. At the age of 15, Anne Makasinski invents a flashlight that doesn't need batteries, just the warmth of a human hand. And that means we're no longer generating greenhouse gases uh, to manufacture those batteries, and we're no longer discarding them and polluting our environment. So it's sort of a two for one, um, and it's just a wonderful idea. She has a technology that's really going to change people's lives. This is one of the prototypes of my flashlight. We have the Peltier tile right here. So essentially, if I put my hand on here, you get light almost instantaneously. That's how it works. How many people lack electric service today? More than a billion people do not have the luxury of electric service. That is over 13% of the world's population. Another innovator became inspired at a young age. Cassandra Lynn was 10 when she learned about climate change and the threat of rising seas. And it honestly really scared me because it's especially relevant to us in Westerly because we're right on the shore. Cassandra's research reveals what she can do about global warming. Used cooking oil can be recycled into biodiesel fuel that powers a home furnace. And biodiesel releases far less carbon into the air than a fossil fuel. Cassandra enlists her classmates to introduce cooking oil recycling to Westerly's restaurants. Her team also expands the mission. Any biodiesel they produce will be given to families who can't afford to buy it. We started brainstorming ideas together and we came up with project TGIF, Turn Grease Into Fuel. The first step is to find some grease. So talking to the first few restaurants was a very nerve-wracking experience because I would say we had to visit the same restaurant maybe 10 or 20 times before we would get them on board. And then they'll provide you with free drums and come periodically to pick up your grease. So it doesn't cost me anything? No. More than 100 restaurants participate in the recycling project, and TGIF's work is getting noticed. Well, welcome to the White House Science Fair. Some of you are here because you saw a problem in your community and you're trying to do something to solve it. Cassandra is among more than 100 students honored for their work in science and community. It's young people like you that make me so confident that America's best days are still to come. TGIF has delivered heating oil at no cost to some 500 families. Its biodiesel has kept more than 3 million pounds of carbon out of the air. Coming up, 
an audacious attempt to clean the world's oceans. There's something really wonderful and inspiring about sheer willingness to roll up sleeves and, and get to work. And a water bottle you can eat. This is a common sense solution. When Weather Gone Viral continues. The North Sea, July 2017. An intrepid group of scientists, engineers, builders, and designers descend upon this inhospitable patch of ocean. Led by 23-year-old Dutch inventor and visionary Boyan Slot, the team prepares a run-through for what's been billed as the largest cleanup in history. You just get a sense of the sheer audacity of one young man and now a whole organization that's taking on a problem of such incredible scale that no country in the world has wanted to take it on. The problem is the estimated 8 million metric tons of plastic waste discarded into the oceans each year. If present trends continue, the weight of plastic in the ocean will be greater than the weight of fish in the ocean by 2050. When I founded the Ocean Cleanup, everyone, told me that there was no way to clean up what's already out there, and the only thing you could do is avoid making it worse. But to me, that was just such an uninspiring message. We can actually make things better again, and we can do this, and we must do this, and we will do this. What happens is that as plastic debris is carried by ocean currents. It ends up getting concentrated in these spinning vortexes. It's creating havoc for the marine ecosystems, for fish populations that, of course, impacts us as well. Slot and his team conduct reconnaissance flights above the largest patch, 1,000 miles off the coast of California. Spotters using high-tech radar cameras and sensors quantify the biggest and most harmful elements. Of course, we can't see the whole thing. Not all of it is at the surface. Some of it is below. 
But by many estimates, the, these large patches and aggregates are tens or hundreds of miles uh, across. Slot and his team have designed an innovative solution to collect the so-called Great Pacific Garbage Patch. A floating barrier will be deployed at the edge of the patch. Ocean currents will then push the plastic debris into the barrier. The barrier will float with the current, but be strong enough to hold the plastic in place. Boats will then collect the plastic and transport it back to be sold as recyclable material. This is a completely new approach, but I would point out it's worth undertaking because the payoff is so high. If this approach works, it will dramatically change our capability to clean up the, uh, the ocean uh, quite quickly. Only time will tell just how successful the ocean cleanup will be. Slot and his team confidently predict that by the year 2023, their efforts will reduce the size of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch by 50%. There's something really wonderful and inspiring about sheer willingness to roll up sleeves and, and get to work. And I, I think that is nowhere more evident than, than with the great ocean cleanup. So there are five areas in the world where ocean currents concentrate the plastic. And the largest one of these accumulations is the infamous Great Pacific Garbage Patch which is the one halfway between Hawaii and California. The world's oceans contain an astounding number of plastic bottles. Many of these bottles begin life with a single purpose, to provide convenient individual servings of drinking water. But quenching the planet's thirst requires an infinite stream of plastic bottles, 50 billion each year in America alone. The vast majority of water bottles are trashed, and many end up degrading the environment. Cleanup and prevention need to go hand in hand. So if you're ultimately going to have a more permanent solution with the plastics crisis in our oceans, you need to limit the use of disposable plastic, perhaps eliminate it entirely. Now, a London-based startup called Skipping Rocks Lab is tackling the world's plastic bottle addiction head on. They've developed a product called OHO that encapsulates water, or any kind of liquid, in a membrane made of seaweed that is natural, biodegradable, and edible. According to the inventors, OHOs are cheaper to make than plastic bottles. Perhaps most important, the membrane will biodegrade in four to six weeks. The average plastic bottle needs 450 years. This is the sort of technology that one can imagine could ultimately be scaled up. Um, to the point where it makes a huge difference. OHO is billed as providing hydration on the go, at concerts, marathons, and out on the street. After extensive public testing, Skipping Rocks Lab is preparing for a full-on release of OHOs, a possible antidote to the plastic plague that bedevils our modern world. So I'm very excited about this idea. It really could be part of the solution to one of the great problems that we face, the, the global plastic pollution problem. Eight glasses per day from bottled water is nearly 3,000 times the cost of tap water. That doesn't include the environmental cost of using oil to make the plastic. Coming up, shining a light on the future with solar windows. It's a genius idea. And painting the town white to turn down the heat. When Weather Gone Viral continues.
Every day, the sun pours down clean energy, unlimited in quantity and free for the taking. Where land is cheap and plentiful, solar cells are economically viable. When we think about big solar farms, we're actually seeing solar outcompete traditional fossil fuels. In cities, however, this scale is nearly impossible to achieve. Solar panels are usually confined to rooftops. There's only so much space, there's only so much rooftop. It's actually pretty limiting in terms of just square footage. But a stunning advance could turn entire cities into solar power generators, the transparent solar cell. The way that this works is it's gonna capture the parts of the solar spectrum that you can't see with your eye. Professor Lunt invented a film coating that turns ordinary glass into a solar cell. Even though the film's on this glass, it remains transparent, just like a window. But shine a light on it, and the glass generates a current, just like a solar cell. To make electricity, the film absorbs only UV and infrared light. We can't see those anyway, so we don't miss them when they're gone. You're only capturing invisible light from the sun. So the amount of electricity that you're able to create from one square inch of the solar film as opposed to one square inch of a solar photovoltaic panel is going to be different. I believe it, it drops by about half. However, the trade-off for lower output is the promise of wider use. Every window in a skyscraper can remain transparent while generating solar power to run the building. Existing buildings can be retrofit from the inside. It's a genius idea to take advantage of that surface area and transform that into electricity to power the building. That's incredible. That's awesome. I love science. Science. The innovative film that turns glass into a solar cell is extremely thin. The film is close to 34 millionths of an inch. How thin is that? A sheet of paper towers over it like a skyscraper. One sheet is more than 100 times thicker than the solar film. While solar windows offer promising help for our energy needs, an innovative initiative aims to take the heat off the streets. Here in Los Angeles, it's a moment of truth. Like many large urban centers, LA is an urban heat island. The heat island effect is the fact that the city tends to be about 10 degrees warmer than the surrounding countryside. The whole world is warming, but cities are actually warming faster than the world around them. Urban environments have a lot of concrete, a lot of blacktop, streets, buildings. We're tightly packed. We have a lot of engines running. The result is an overheated city an urban heat island like Los Angeles. Until recently, the focus in talking about climate change has been about reducing carbon emissions to reduce the potential climate change. But now we're starting to focus on adapting to the climate change that's already happening. Among the adaptations being tested in Los Angeles is this asphalt-based seal coat. It's squeegeed onto the street surface where it dries to a light gray color. You're relying on pretty simple physics, and it works. Um, you reduce temperatures by somewhere around 12 to, to 17%. By reducing that urban heat island, you may be reducing energy consumption, which in turn will reduce fossil fuel use as well. In this pilot program, one street in each of 15 city council districts is getting the seal coat. What might seem like a small solution can be scaled up in a way that makes a real difference. Seal coat on just one third of LA streets could save around $100 million in energy costs. One of our goals with this pilot is to signal other cities that it's okay to experiment and try new materials and try to adapt to a warmer, drier world. Climatologists say that over the past century, Average temperatures in Los Angeles have been rising due to the heat island effect produced by asphalt roadways, parking lots, and roofs. Coming up, a radical new way of storing water in the desert. Basically shifting the seasons. 
and a teen's invention could provide clean water for millions. There's no reason that this couldn't be deployed at the global scale. When Weather Gone Viral continues. With the weather being so turbulent and hard to predict, it seems people all over the world are inventing ways to cope. India's northern region of Ladakh in the foothills of the Himalayas is just such a place. Ladakh has always been a cold, high altitude desert. Farming and livelihoods where we depend on glacial melt waters have never been easy. But global warming has shrunk glaciers severely. In some years, meltwater doesn't even trickle down to the villages and farms. That's a real threat um, to uh, the water supply for a very large uh, number of people, for billions of people. Our lifeline is disappearing, and therefore the need for the people to adapt, to innovate, and to find new ways of uh, dealing with these hardships. Sonam Wangchuk, an engineer and teacher, dreams up a way to offset retreating glaciers. Wangchuk grew up in Ladakh and has long been determined to address the water shortages that threaten life in his mountainous home. Employing basic physics, he'll store water in a frozen tower close to the village where it's needed. Wangchuk calls these towers ice stupas because they look like Buddhist shrines of the same name. He teaches his ice stupa idea to his village. 
Imagine that the bucket there is the source of water. So we take a pipe up slope, put it in the stream or the lake, bury it six feet under the ground, and the pipe takes water down slope to the village or the desert where we want to green or plant trees. Because of the gravity, pressure builds up in the pipe. Then water comes out gushing like this. With temperatures of minus 20 or lower at night, the spraying water freezes before it hits the ground. The ice stupa takes shape over several weeks. We started piloting the ice stupa in real life application. People of the village came and volunteered to plant 5,000 trees, which were supported in the lean months by the moisture from the ice stupa. And that is a proof of concept. What he appears to have done is come up with a really great way of basically shifting the seasons in some respects. You've got a world in which you're always depending on water melting in a certain time of the year, and he's able to basically store that water to another time of the year. Buddhist monks in Ladakh are helping Wangchak. And the ice stupas will be also along the mountains. Together, they're planning more ice stupas to counteract the problem of climate change. We should go beyond just solving it into turning it into an opportunity to green the deserts that were never greened by our ancestors. Wang Chuck's goal is for ice stupas to feed forests in the Ladakhi Desert, a feat not even nature attempted. We Ladakhis are the frontier to face climate change. We have to be resilient, clever enough, innovative enough to adapt to these changes so that our younger generation is ready to survive and flourish in these mountains. It is the shape, not the height. The stupa's conical form offers relatively little surface area to the sun, so it heats slowly. The tower made in March of 2015 didn't fully melt until four months later in July. The town of Chañaral in Chile is two continents away from Ladakh, but it faces a similar crisis, the life-choking shortage of fresh water. Chañaral stares out at the undrinkable Pacific Ocean. The town's encircled on its other three sides by Chile's Atacama Desert, among the driest places on the planet. Climate change uh, is actually decreasing the amount of fresh water um, that's available. We're going to need to find inventive uh, solutions to dealing with the growing global water crisis. Chanyaral's location, wedged between the ocean and a range of low-lying foothills, is perfect for just such a solution. Coastal fog pushing into the foothills is the secret to drought relief in Chanyaral and similar locations. A fog cloud is simply just a collection of water droplets, and people are figuring out ways now of capturing that cloud water and putting it to use. Nets like these are known as fog catchers. They're used worldwide, wherever water is scarce and fog plentiful. Fog condenses on the mesh. The water drips down into a collection trough and then into a storage container. Clean, usable water from fog. It's cheap requires very little maintenance at all, no electricity required either. So this is like the perfect solution, especially to poor nations around the world that could really benefit from taking fog and turning it into water that they so desperately need. The fog catchers of Chanyara are more than just a source of water. They're the gateway to a new life. The town's fishing business had been wiped out after toxic runoff from a copper mine killed many ocean species in the region. With their main source of income destroyed, a group of fishermen sought economic alternatives, and the fog catchers provided the solution. Now, some of Chanyaral's fishermen have become farmers. They irrigate fields of aloe vera with water pulled drop by drop from Pacific Ocean fog. The Atacama and other deserts aren't the only places starved for safe drinking water. Even regions showered by monsoon rains, like parts of India, can be plagued by drinking water scarcity. But here, the problem is poverty and pollution, not drought. It's a world few Americans ever see. 
Deepika Kurup is an exception. She was born and raised in New Hampshire, but traces her family roots to India. My parents are originally from India, and I am very fortunate to have the opportunity to travel back to India every year since before I can remember. I also saw something that was really quite uh, shocking and disturbing. I often saw children who were collecting all of their water from these contaminated river sources, basically drinking water that me growing in, up in America, I wouldn't even think of touching. Buying clean water is expensive. Water for a day would cost about 20% of the day's wage. Is clean drinking water a right or is it a commodity? And I think a lot of people feel that it should be a right. It is, after all, necessary for life. After seeing people without access to clean water, I really felt like this was an unacceptable social injustice. I was around maybe 13 or 14, and I was really interested in science. So I thought the best way that I could contribute to solving this problem was through a scientific solution. Research led Deepika to a compound called titanium dioxide. When activated by sunlight, it kills bacteria. After months of experimentation, Deepika invented a titanium dioxide cement that would adhere to the inside of a container, anything from small water bottles to large storage tanks. The water will be purified as long as sunlight can shine inside. For a larger community-based uh, water purification system, the idea would be either to create a water tank out of my photocatalytic composite or to coat the inside of an existing water tank and that way the water would continue to be purified as it's stored. In 2012, Deepika's solar-powered water filter earns her the title America's Top Young Scientist. She and her invention go on to win the grand prize at the 3M Young Scientist Challenge a few months later. This honor caught the attention of the White House. It was an incredibly humbling and amazing experience to be able to speak with President Obama, to know that the President of the United States was so passionate about uh, young people getting involved in, in scientific endeavors. Deepika's invention could give millions of people around the world access to clean water for the first time in their lives. There's no reason that this couldn't be deployed at the global scale. It's a great solution and it's a great role model for other uh, young women. How many people do not have access to safe drinking water? Approximately 11% of the world's population lacks clean water. Coming up, New York City sinks thousands of its old train cars off the East Coast. Is it reckless dumping or an ecological masterstroke? And can the sun activate this stationary building to fight air pollution? When Weather Gone Viral continues.
Every day, about 1.6 million people commute into Manhattan. At all hours, New York shuttle trains are the city's heartbeat, the pulse that drives the celebrated metropolis. But after decades of service, trains wear out. Once a shining asset, they become just a costly disposal problem. The obsolete train cars have to go somewhere. What happens to them? An MTA employee named Michael Zakia dreams up a creative disposal solution. Drop them in the ocean. Trying to convince people that the best way to dispose of the cars that we've been using for 40 years was to put them underwater was not an easy sell. Uh, the initial response was, why are you just dumping New York's trash in our ocean? But in the old cars, Zakia sees new promise for the coastal environment. The east coast of the United States is basically a desert bottom uh, from New York all the way to Florida. There's not much relief. Zakia figures that to a fish or a sea sponge, a train car is as good as a reef. When it settles to the bottom, these marine animals have something to attach to. And this in turn attracts fish. And those fish then find a place to hide and avoid predators and therefore increasing their numbers. Several states express interest, but MTA does have some prep work before the train cars are seaworthy. All the greases and oils were chemically removed from the cars, and the cars were then steam cleaned. August 22, 2001. After two years of planning, the rail cars begin their final ride. Even stripped down, each car weighs 40,000 pounds. It sinks straight to the bottom, about 80 feet below. I'm a New Yorker all my life, using the subway cars to travel through the city. Seeing the first car enter the water was a, a bittersweet experience. It was kind of, um, it was very moving. What we see down there is tremendous. We're creating habitat for the fish. We're creating areas where fishermen can go and divers can go. And we're creating economic benefit for the local communities. All of that because one person looks at a problem and sees an opportunity. This is the only planet we have, and we have to take care of it in order to sustain life. I feel really good about it. I'm proud of what we did, uh, and I think it's something that will endure. New York train cars make a great reef, but fish are open-minded about alternatives. In addition, artificial reefs have been made out of everything from an armored personnel carrier to a U.S. Navy warship, to a Boeing 737. While New York City enlists its subway cars to build coral-like reefs, Mexico City has deployed a coral-like faced building to battle air pollution. You have all of this surface area that's available. Why not take advantage of it um, in, in this way to try to do something about urban pollution problems? Mexico City's millions of cars pour a steady stream of pollutants into the air. Among the most dangerous are nitrogen oxides, NOx for short, toxic agents that put the acid in acid rain. This graceful facade on a Mexico City hospital was specifically designed by Berlin-based architect Alison Dring and her colleagues to destroy NOx and other pollutants. We have invented a product that starts to get the building to interact with something like air pollution. The building's facade is made of tiles, each coated with titanium dioxide, the chemical that breaks down the pollutants. The process begins when the sun strikes the facade. With the sunrise, you would have the, the reaction being triggered on the surface, and uh, it would have an immediate effect. The sunlight activates the titanium dioxide. Ferocious but invisible chemical reactions ensue. It's estimated the reactions on this facade remove the pollution generated by 1,000 cars per day. When the NOx reaches the surface, it is chemically converted, so it really is gone, and what you're getting is the harmless byproducts from that process. Those byproducts include carbon dioxide, water, and calcium nitrate, a salt used in fertilizers, which is harmlessly washed away by the rain. When she designed the facade, Dring wanted to maximize its efficiency. She found an idea in the natural world. 
Corals like this one evolved ridges and valleys. They add to its surface area, allowing the coral to absorb more light than if it was flat. The many ridges and valleys molded into the tiles do the same thing. It has omnidirectionality, so the light can hit it from any, any angle, and we then get an improved efficacy for the technology. The facade absorbs pollution in the immediate vicinity of the building. As the technology becomes more widespread, so too will its reach. I think this will be a technology that will be a part of the toolbox to remove pollution as we increase populations in cities. Coming up, solar-powered vehicles race across the Australian outback. And the sky's the limit for solar satellites when Weather Gone Viral continues.
The Australian outback is one of the largest, most desolate places on Earth. Vast and barren, it seems an odd backdrop for a world-class auto race. But this sun-baked emptiness is a perfect outdoor lab for pushing solar cells to their absolute limit. Every two years, inventors and engineers from around the world come to Australia for one reason, to race solar-powered cars across the continent. Their mission, to advance environmental technologies for cleaner cars and a more sustainable future. The World Solar Challenge is the oldest and most prestigious solar car race in the world. Um, it started in 1987. Kelsey Josend and her Stanford teammates spent two years designing and building a car for the 2017 race. We built the car out of carbon fiber, which is ultra light. Got a 98% efficient electric motors. Uh, the entire drive train is custom to us. Um, and the whole car um, runs on about the same amount of power as a toaster. October 8, 2017, the race begins in the city of Darwin at the northernmost edge of Australia. 42 cars from nearly two dozen countries compete in three classes. Stanford's solar car is one of 27 in the Challenger class. All share a similar mission. The cars here are super light. They have only one driver. The whole objective is to go as fast as possible. They're really small um, and they look kind of like spaceships or boats uh, more than cars. There's no air conditioning. Um, the entire driver's seat is just a piece of phone the driver sits on. So it's not super comfortable, but it's not miserable. We, we don't want our drivers to suffer too much. It's a long race, 1,864 miles from Darwin to Adelaide. Even the fastest cars need five days to cross the continent. A Dutch team wins the Challenger class when its car arrives in Adelaide two hours before any of its rivals. Their catamaran-style solar car averages a speed of 50 miles per hour. The Stanford squad finishes ninth out of the 27 teams that began the race. It's a satisfying ending in a field with a bright future. Here's something that sounds like science fiction, but it's real. Taking energy from the sun and powering an automobile. Not even close. Globally, we need 18 terawatts of energy each day. The sun beams down 173,000 terawatts daily, nearly 10,000 times as much as we need. While solar cars are limited by the intermittent nature of sunlight, there's one place where the sun shines virtually all the time, space. And today, scientists are working tirelessly to develop a way of harnessing solar energy via satellites. There is so much energy coming from the sun and just flowing past us in space. If we could harvest even a fraction of that energy, it could make a stupendous contribution to humanity's energy needs. Capturing the sun's energy and beaming it down to Earth to make electricity is a tantalizing prospect. Here's how it works. Solar power satellites orbit tens of thousands of miles above the Earth's surface. They're solar panels bathing in sunshine. The solar energy that the satellites collect is converted to electricity then transformed to radio frequency, or RF energy, and beamed down to Earth by a microwave or laser. Once on Earth, it's picked up by receiving antennas, reconverted to electricity, and put out onto the grid. There's the very real possibility that we could see this deployed um, at a pretty large scale in a matter of a decade or two. To date, solar satellite technology has been hampered by cost and safety concerns but with added research and refinement, it seems certain to one day replace our dependence on fossil fuels. In due course, whether we want it or not, we are going to no longer use fossil fuels. We're going to essentially deplete, in the coming decades, oil. In the coming centuries, coal. And in the coming millennia, natural gas. Space solar power could become a major player in reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, by 2050, 2060, not centuries from now. 
Space solar power is just one of the countless inventions and innovations that scientists are developing to improve lives on Earth and save our planet. It may be that it's not any single one of these innovations that's going to save the planet, but taken together as we all work towards renewables and taking advantage of the energy that is provided to us for free every day from that big ball in the sky, if we move towards that, we're going to have a much better future. And this morning on AMHQ Early, the flood threat grows. More than a foot of rain pushes rivers to record levels across the southern plains. We are tracking another round of drenching showers today. Plus, shots of cold air in the northeast. Places like Plymouth, New Hampshire will feel the temps drop as the coldest air of the season moves in and on the mend. It has been one week since Hurricane Michael slammed into the Florida Panhandle. We'll take a look and show you the tremendous damage left behind 30 miles from even the coast. AMHQ Early begins right now. Good Wednesday morning, everyone. I'm meteorologist Jen Carfagno. The Southern Plains bracing for ongoing flooding as rounds of showers drench the region today. The Llano and Colorado rivers in central Texas are falling today, but a foot of rain has drenched areas of the hill country since Sunday, and it's coming down still this morning. Look at the, just look at the flow of the water, how fast it's going. This is Marble Falls on Tuesday. The Guadalupe River at Kerrville remains a concern, too. It has jumped a remarkable 40 feet since Monday night, blowing past its record crest by 16 feet. Look, look at this. You can see water into homes, at least up to the first floor uh, vehicles. You can see an RV in the background there just completely inundated with water. It is just a mess with flooding and it's an ongoing situation because we still have more rain in the area. And we know that that water is going to be moving downstream as well. Um, in the rivers and through the lakes in the area. So let me show you what's going on right now when it comes to the weather. We've got this persistent feed of moisture coming in here from the Pacific, and that's at the mid to upper levels, but also at the surface, we've got some air coming in like this from the Gulf of Mexico. So lots of sources of sources of moisture. And I want to point out real quick this upper level low that we have back out here over the four corners. So with that, we're getting this flow that looks like this. And when you spread air out like this, uh, aloft, it's going to make air rise. So we're going to continue to make air rise and rising air creates clouds and rain. And it's right in the zone today. Still some heavy rain is possible. And you can see it's south of Dallas right now. Luckily, it's out of the warning area. Uh, but we, of course, have just had too much yesterday. And we're still looking at concerns in Burnett and Travis counties, Jonestown, Lago Vista, and Lakeway under this flash for the warning until 5 o'clock this morning. Does include the Lake Travis area. Watching that concern as the water levels rise there, like Buchanan as well. Look at this rainfall. This is just the past 24 hours, and we're talking three to five, if not even six or seven inches of rain. You go back to the weekend, it is eight to 12 inches of rain that has fallen across this area. That's why we have river gauges that are running in moderate to major flood stage. And 9 million people across central Texas are under flood alerts today. Governor Greg Abbott has put 18 counties under a state of emergency. New this morning, authorities say they've pulled one body from the Colorado River. That person has not been identified. Oh, my God. The bridge collapsed. The Llano River takes down a bridge. The crossing now a gaping hole. The Llano meets the Colorado River at Kingsland. The Colorado River is actually running backwards. The Llano is pushing it up all sorts of debris in the water, boats, trailers, watercraft. The river tore a dock loose too, sending it over Stark Dam. These flood waters are flowing from uh, Llano, down the Llano River towards Lake LBJ. Stark Dam holds back Lake LBJ. In all my life, I've never seen LBJ running like a flooding river. It's amazing. The Llano River jumped a remarkable 35 feet in less than 12 hours. It crested at nearly 40 feet, just below the 1935 record, high enough to push river water to roof lines. It's just a testament to what happens when you have these huge rain events. Authorities say at least 85 homes in Marble Falls took on water. The flooding kept first responders busy. Officials pleaded with drivers to stay home. Rising water is blocking roads throughout our county. Please do not attempt to cross them. Closed roads left people pinned down and cut off. I'm not going to say a couple hours. I'm <laughs> about. It's going to be a while. Okay. okay. 
Emily McCaskill couldn't reach her parents. Obviously, we're worried, but um, hopefully they're still they're still safe and they're still dry. Another reason for concern, rain is still falling in Central Texas. I worry about the next few days as it gets wetter and wetter, presumably. We have more rain coming and flooding in Central Texas will keep schools in Llano and Marble Falls closed today. Schools in Burnett and Harper will open on a two hour delay. More rain today, more rain tomorrow, more rain in the forecast as we get into the weekend as well. I want to talk about this pattern that we're looking at here as we continue to watch uh, this this upper level low. I showed you where that is here over the southwest that moves in. You know, we we do see in general a little bit of a ridge build here across the southern plains, but that is going to mean that we continue to just see the moisture move in, get stuck in Texas. There's nothing to push this out. So this old front that's stuck here across the area is going to mean that we continue to keep the moisture around. And then another disturbance comes in from Mexico to just enforce, reinforce the chance of rainfall coming in across this area. So it will be heavy at times. Um, we'll be looking at totals adding up. This is the forecast today, tomorrow into Friday. You can see rain here across central and northern Texas. The lower Mississippi Valley or the middle Mississippi Valley gets into it as well. We've got a couple of fronts coming down from the north as well. And that's really what's going to help get you that rain up there into Missouri and parts of Arkansas as well. All right, Dallas, the other story with the rainfall has been how chilly it has been. We're going to spend a day again with chilly rain. We'll at least get out of the 40s, but it's going to be well below our average of 78 degrees. That's what you would expect for October, right? Yesterday, the State Fair of Texas had to close early because of the weather. I'm not sure. We'll see what they do today, but the weather's not much better. Thursday and Friday, temperatures creep up to near 60, but still staying in the 50s. It's Saturday and Sunday that we finally get to warm up and we finally get to dry out. Let's look at Midland, Texas. We're going to have another cold, rainy day. Our average again near 80. Uh, this time of year, we're going to spend the next two days in the 40s near 50. Um, by the weekend, we'll finally get to dry out, but we're not seeing a huge warm up. It's not like it's going to get hot. It just is not going to be so shivery as it's been. Let's go to Nashville and here as well. We're going to be watching the weather for you this week, taking a live look at there. temperatures have cooled down for sure. It is 48 degrees in Nashville right now. Let's take a look at your forecast here as we look at the southeast, a front that's coming into the area, bringing a few showers right now. You know, that Pacific moisture that I talked about over parts of southern Texas, that moisture is actually streaming all along this boundary right into the mid Atlantic. Um, and so we are getting some rain out there. Tennessee, it looks like middle Tennessee, your rain really was the last two days. Today we should have a drier day, but chilly. And then we're going to see that rain out there across parts of Mississippi and northern Alabama. A few showers in the Atlanta area. Now where it's been warmer and almost downright hot, like in eastern North Carolina and eastern South Carolina, we could see some thunderstorms. And today we start the day with thunderstorms right around Cape Hatteras. A few showers in the Atlanta area. You can see few and far between, really not much. Most of it North Georgia. Rain is coming into Birmingham for your commute this morning, especially north of town. And there'll be some showers throughout the day today as this front goes south. It doesn't have a lot of access to moisture with it. So we're not going to see, you know, a big flow coming in from the south and Gulf moisture coming in and showers and thunderstorms. It's really just a few spotty showers. So as you plan your day, yes, it's worth maybe bringing the umbrella. But uh, if you don't have room in your bag or your purse, I'm not sure I'd worry about it today because it really will be sort of a spotty forecast with showers here through the north and or through the south and east. All right, and this morning we continue our coverage here uh, as we continue to take you to the aftermath of Hurricane Michael. Now, here along the Gulf Coast, uh, we're going to continue the cleanup again today. Uh, and so as we take you into this damage, uh, we'll show you stories from the area. We've been cutting trees down with a chainsaw and then hauling them off of this thing. Newlyweds Chad and Alyssa Collier aren't wasting any time helping out with little resources. We're just trying to get things out of the way to try to get it back to as normal as possible. I married uh, a year ago. Well, yeah, it'll be a year in November. So yep. we'll be celebrating our year doing the same thing yeah, we're doing today. Up. <laughs> Hopefully with power by then. The couple lives in Youngstown, Florida, about 20 miles inland from Panama City. But despite not being on the coast, the damage here from Hurricane Michael is extensive. The Colliers made the last minute decision not to ride it out, and they're glad they did. We were watching the news and we saw that the storm was changing into a four and maybe a five, so then we decided yeah. it's, too, it's too bad for us to stay and we don't want to take the risk. Everybody we've talked to, they, they regret it and said it's the worst decision they ever made and they'll never do it again. Lifelong resident Joe Griffin feels the same way. He did not leave. I'd never do that again. 
I'll never do that again. I thought once it hit land, you know, that it would probably calm down some, wouldn't be quite as bad here, but that wasn't the case. It just stayed strong. It all stayed the way strong through all the Florida. way through. Griffin was born and raised in this 100 year old home. I don't know. I don't know what we'll do. Uh, it's going to take a lot of a adjustment, I guess, you know. This place, it'll never be the same. And neither will the extensive tree canopy. One thing that's shocking is the widespread nature to this destruction. This row of pine trees here extends 12 miles back that way. You can also see the uniformity to all this. Look at how they all snapped, one after the other, at about 10 feet high. Griffin works in the timber industry, and for him and his neighbors, the loss of these trees is going to hurt. We can salvage some of it, but nothing like it would be. It's going to have to be at a drastically reduced price because it's going to be so labor intense to, to harvest it now. Still, both the Colliers and the Griffins plan to stay put here in Youngstown. It was just the perfect place to live, perfect place to raise children. All my grandchildren are here and uh, they can go and do. It's just kind of a unique place. Yeah, it is, and so sad to see. And you know, a lot of us have described you know, the, the mass destruction uh, that came out of this as what looked like tornado damage. Um, but you can see the uniformity of the winds knocking all the trees in one direction. That was you know, truly just straight line winds that came in with this very strong hurricane. Let's take you into the forecast today as we continue to look at the recovery. Panama City, Florida it will be another dry and warm day. Temperatures, thankfully, overnight have been cooling down somewhat for people without power. Um, but during the afternoon, we'll warm up to 89 degrees today. We'll hit 84 tomorrow. Overnight lows will drop into the mid-60s. By the weekend, we start to see the chance for some showers coming in. And it's really next week that our next larger chance of rain comes into the area. So urging folks to get those roofs uh, with blue tarps on, et cetera, to, uh, to get ready for rain that comes next week. Tallahassee, a similar situation out there. We've got another warm day ahead. We're heading to 91 degrees. This is up near record high temperatures. It's going to be warm on Thursday and Friday. The front does get closer. It doesn't bring a lot of rain. Uh, just helps knock down our temperatures a little bit here. Chance of showers comes in on Saturday. Sunday still dry, but noticeably cooler thanks to that front coming on through. And by the time we get to next week again, that's when I think you'll start to look at you know, more rain chances coming back in. Thankfully, we have another dry five days here in Mexico Beach. But again, the heat, 89 degrees for today. Apalachicola, we're going to see dry conditions. Sunday, the front does come in. Doesn't bring much in the way of rain, maybe overnight as we get into your Saturday. Um, but looking at uh, cooler temperatures by Sunday, we're going to be cooling down with highs only in the mid-70s. And, and that's a trend that's going to last into next week. All right, but let's let's look ahead to the week uh, weekend, I should say, looking at your weekend in view, and we'll look at the whole country. So we focus here on the southeast. I want to take you up to the north. We've got a couple of fronts coming in, including today. Uh, front number two for the week brings some rain. We'll see that across upstate New York, all the way up into New England. More rain coming in, and it will knock down our temperatures as well. So looking ahead to what's coming our way, look at this, New York City. You go from nearly 60 to 47 degrees as an example of the temperature drop you're going to see. And also, notice this, this whole time, we've got more rain in the Southern Plains. That's not changing. Rain this week, that pattern remaining in place, very wet there as well. Now, as we get you into the weekend, this is Friday. So making your Friday plans, we've got a front coming in through the Great Lakes. That comes in and finally starts to pick up what we got going on in Texas and move that out. It is going to bring some showers up to uh, the upper Midwest, Chicago, watching your weather, South Bend, watching your weather. Uh, we're looking ahead, a, a sort of secondary little front coming in on Saturday, late in the day, and then we see that coming in across the lakes. Very blustery, very wintry feeling to the air, or late fall anyway, is what it's going to feel like. And then that moves into the northeast as we get into Sunday, knocking down temperatures again. So it's, this is the season. We get these fronts to come in. Ahead of the front, you warm up. Behind the front, you cool down. And we get a couple days with highs only in the 40s from the Midwest to the northeast. And it is amazing out there. And we've got your social pictures to show it. This is a shot of a storm brewing over Myrtle Beach, South Carolina on Tuesday. Look at that. You can see the big rain shaft out there coming down. They've got a shelf cloud, out, I'm sure, at the leading edge of this. So yesterday we did pick up rain, uh, and we'll see. We should be all right today. Now, talk about a stunning photograph. This is a blazing sunset captured along the Jersey Shore in Monmouth County, New Jersey. Look at that sky. This, these mid-level clouds are perfect to capture all of the sun's light at that time of day. All right, coming up, we're going to talk more about snow and the forecast. We'll show you where.
Lyft is rolling out its monthly subscription plan nationwide. The rideshare company started testing the new service earlier this year in select markets. Lyft's all-access pass costs $299 a month. Riders can take 30 rides each month as long as each doesn't cost more than $15. Riders will have to pay the difference if it does. Unused rides do not roll over to the next month. And for a limited time, subscribers will also get a 5% discount on additional rides. Very interesting. Is that the future, right? We all just share our cars and use Lyft and Uber and et cetera. Well, I'm going to take you traveling. If you're driving your own car this morning, I'm going to show you what you need to watch out for. We are your travel headquarters here on AMHQ. Dallas, not looking good again. We've got more rain in the forecast. You can see rain out there this morning. Temperatures remain very chilly. We're going to be in the 40s and 50s. And uh, I'll tell you what, right through the lunchtime, we're going to be watching for showers continuing here into the afternoon and evening. You know, I just learned around the Dallas area that you guys have one of the worst reverse commutes in the country, meaning that l both directions are always bottlenecked. Um, at all commute times. So morning and afternoon, people are going into the city for work, but people that live in the city are also going out to the suburbs for work as well. So the weather never helps, right? The weather never helps, and we do see some showers out there this morning. They're pretty scattered right now and mainly light, but you can see some heavier rain coming in from the south and west, and that should unfortunately get to the downtown area as we get into the morning hours for their commute. Look at that, Dallas. Tail end of the commute. But I know in Dallas, like every other big city around the country, your commute starts at like 530 a.m. and it goes until 8, 9 30 uh, a.m. as well. So afternoon is going to be tough as well. Well, high winds and an old tree combined to create this headache for one homeowner in the Northeast. Look at that big tree. It fell on a house in Salem, Massachusetts. At nearby Logan Airport, a 40 mile an hour wind gust was recorded. The strong winds prompted a gale warning for most of the coast off New England as well. And another shot of cold air moves into New England this morning. We had one shot come in with that front yesterday in the northeast that also brought the winds. We're going to have another shot come in today. So we say good morning to you in Ellsworth, Maine. You're going to need to bundle up this week. Temperatures in the 40s, maybe low 50s. Overnight lows will drop below freezing. Tis the season. Changing out your jackets, changing out your shoes, making sure you have the kids in some warmer gear heading off to school. Let's take a look at what's happening here. So first cold shot came in. We saw that front. We felt the front. We heard the front in the northeast with all that wind that we had. And behind it did come in some colder air. And now we've got another front that's coming in again today. So here we go with the forecast. We're going to see some rain showers with the cold front as it comes in. This is about 3 o'clock. So Albany in the Capital District, Schenectady, we've got showers. Northern Pennsylvania including around Scranton and Williamsport. We've got some showers coming on in. Behind it, as the cold air comes in, could we see a few snow showers? Yes, we could, actually. They're going to be very scattered, very light, not looking for any significant accumulation. Maybe the mountains, you know, you get a nice coating up there. But uh, we'll get some help from the lakes, but this is not a big big lake effect event. It's just the season, right, to watch that kind of that kind of situation. So here's a look at the forecast. And, you know, today we've got that, or tonight we've got that chance for some snow showers working in across the area. And then there's another chance as we get into the weekend. So, you know, we have the chance for some one to three type accumulation. Elevation's going to matter. Access to the lakes will matter as well. And I think you really got to you know, have some elevation for it to, to stick on the ground and last at, at any time. There's the second cold side of air that comes in over the weekend. It gets you in the Great Lakes. It gets you in the northeast. It sinks down into the Ohio Valley, even into the south. Actually, that second shot of cold air will move. So there's going to be some big changes coming. The heart of it is up here in the northeast, though. And so Saranac Lake, we've got one front coming in today. Here we go with rain, maybe mixing with some snow at the end. Snow showers possible overnight. Look at these lows, 21 degrees. Yes, the seasons are changing. And one of the reasons so many people love snow is that it coats everything in a clean white blanket. But if you think about it, it seems weird that snow is white, all, you know, water is clear, right? So where does it get its distinctive color? Well, meteorologist Mark Elliott has the answer. One of the most beautiful sights of winter is freshly fallen snow, which blankets everything in that crisp, cool white. But why is snow white in the first place, especially when water and ice appear clear? Well, it all has to do with light. Visible light from the sun comes in a variety of wavelengths that our eyes see as different colors. When light hits an object, whatever combination of wavelengths are reflected back determines the color of that object as we see it. If all wavelengths are absorbed, the object looks black, but if all wavelengths 
wavelengths are reflected, the object appears white. Snowflakes are intricate ice crystals with lots of space for air molecules to hang out between them. Light beams are bounced around every which way by the complex shape of the crystals, so much so that all wavelengths are reflected back out of the snow, making it appear white. Even though the winter sky may be gray and dreary, you can always stop and enjoy the serene look of that fresh fallen white snow. That makes me think about glaciers. And you know, glaciers often you see that blue color. So I'm gonna do a little research on that and see uh, what, why that happens if it's because of sort of the way the, the, uh, the ice links together. All right, let's take a look though at snow because that's what we're talking about. Um, we have been getting some snow, right? You saw your first snows of the season, Lacrosse, Wisconsin, Kansas City. Is that unusual? Yes, Kansas City. It was the earliest on record, actually. It's often late November or December before we see our first snow. And it's usually November up here for the Midwest, like Lacrosse, Wisconsin, and up here into the Northeast as well. It's really just the West and elevations here in the Northeast that would see snow in October. Or, of course, the higher you go, like Mount Washington. September snows are not unusual. In fact, on average, our first snow there. Taking a look at some specific spots, Burlington, Buffalo, it's usually early November before we see our first snow. And flooding has prompted some homeowner, homeowners in the Southern Plains to leave. Coming up, more on the destruction after a foot of rain has fallen and when some drier weather could be on the way.
And good morning, everyone. Thanks for staying with us on AMH2 Early. I'm meteorologist Jen Carfagno. Right now, flooding concerns continue to rise across the southern plains. We're tracking another round of showers that will drench already saturated land and rivers and creeks that are full. The constant rain showers soaking the southern plains have people on high alert. Llano County, Texas is one area that was hit hard yesterday. Look at these floodwaters moving very fast. This video shows aerials near Lake LBJ, and you can see the water raging out of the dam and seeping over the sides of the river. More rain is expected to saturate several areas today here in central Texas and northern Texas as well. And they've opened the floodgates, too, trying to manage all that water here that eventually gets into Lake Buchanan and Lake Travis. There are some flood warnings, flash flood warnings that are up until 5 o'clock this morning here local time. And look at the moisture. I want to point out what's happening here in the Southern Plains. We've had a lot of Pacific moisture that's coming into this area, mid to upper levels mainly, and that's streaming in. And this has been persistent and nonstop. At the surface, we do have some winds coming in from the south, bringing in some of that Gulf moisture as well. But now today, we've got this upper level low, which is spinning back here over the the four corners. As that moves closer to the area, that's just going to help evacuate air at the upper levels. And when air moves out of the upper levels, something's got to replace it. So air comes up from beneath and air that's rising creates clouds and rain. And so we're going to get more of that today. Watching for some showers out there right now from San Angelo to Dallas. We do have that flash flood warning that I mentioned, um, but luckily the rain is out of the area right now. It's all about the water that is moving uh, downstream the Lana River and the Colorado River and getting uh, and, and LBG our Lake LB, you should say, and getting over towards Lake Buchanan and Lake Travis. We've had uh, in just the last 24 hours more than six, seven, eight inches of rain. You go back to the weekend, we've had eight to 12 inches of rain. It's why we've got the major flooding that is ongoing right here in the area. We had our peak on the Llano River yesterday. Luckily, it is falling, and in fact, it's falling now very quickly. But this is a classic flash flood situation. Look how quickly it went up and then came back down. Now, it doesn't look like you will soon be drying out anytime soon. Corpus Christi, Texas, we're taking a live look at you this morning. Also kind of chilly out there. Temperature's 54. It feels like 50 and very gray out here as we start your day. More showers in store. Sometimes this they're week. very quick. So you the know, rest of the week, and they you hit and they go down and come back you're, up. You're at it's it, not like these massive wedge it's tornadoes it's that you see in the plains. Day. But, you know, and they're going to be rain a every moment of every day. But you've got a chance of rage every single day. These are something that you always have to. So here's a look There's that slow moving upper level low showed you on the water vapor as we look intensify, to the rest of the week we do have a sort of some rigginess right building landfall. in the jet stream it but not it, that right it's not yet. um we're not going to see a clean sweeping front this. come through that's why so the there's nothing to clear out the air mass we're stuck with this moisture coast. another disturbance comes in from per, over mexico and that was in help trigger more rain and so we end up with this very wet pattern continuing showers out there in northern texas dallas lubbock we've got more showers coming our way and it's going to stay chilly yes overnight lows and afternoon highs are not going to be budging very, very, very much at all. So we are going to see a low average pretty much across the entire state. Rain uh, and we're going to be watching for that as we get into the weekend as well. So like we start we said, to warm up this uh, weekend. Um, we start to dry uh, out this weekend. We so this but we're, we're still running time. below average. It's That's start the story there. We're still running below average. Friday's forecast more rain up towards Dallas and Fort Worth, getting into Oklahoma and across the Red River. Rain for you there. Dallas, we might squeak out some dry times on Saturday. Look, we have been so wet this week for the state fair. Uh, they had to close early to yesterday, so we'll see if we can play. get some good times right. in this weekend so as they start to wrap things Each up there. But look at the temperatures. Staying below average, we should be about 78 degrees rainfall. this time of year. Right. We're not going to get there the in the time next here, five days. Governor Rick Scott now, some thunderstorms could slow down the recovery in areas and cleaning Scott, up from Hurricane Michael. But some relief will also come in the form of a slight temperature drop in cities like Tallahassee. We are going to the 90s again today, but by the weekend, a front comes in and we drop to the mid-80s. So let's take a look at that forecast. It is going to be another hot day for us here along but the Jim, Gulf Coast. Jim, my biggest concern is uh, I've been traveling the last uh, two days. In. And There's not a ton of moisture with it. It will bring some showers up here into Alabama. Out. You see Listen a couple of showers from northern Georgia, maybe a few in the Atlanta area. There could be some thunderstorms like we see in the eastern North Carolina you know, this, this morning. Horrible. up and on. I think